Millions of people do it. Taxpayer beware. Some innocently, some knowingly, some criminally. Actor Wesley Snipes convicted of failing to file federal tax returns. It's over 5,000 a day just in penalties and interest. There's many bad things that can happen. Cases can go to extremes. So why do millions still choose to cheat? We demonize the tax system. And how far is too far? Anybody who cheats on their taxes intentionally is a crook. This is the last place you want your tax return to end up. The Internal Revenue Service Forensic Lab in Chicago. I'm Becky Quick, and in this hour, we'll show you how special agents use CSI technology to uncover hidden evidence of tax fraud. So who is swindling the IRS? It could be just about anybody. Millions of Americans knowingly lie on their tax forms, and every year the government loses out on roughly $300 billion. But is cheating worth the risk? We'll meet one woman who lost nearly everything after falling for a bogus tax scheme, a former millionaire who's now in prison, and those who hate the IRS so much, they've resorted to violence. Lakeland, Florida, 2008. Randy Nowak is a construction business owner being audited by the IRS. He failed to pay more than $300,000 in back taxes, and he's hiding $4 million in a Jamaican bank account. To the IRS, he's just another tax cheat until he goes too far. Instead of hiring a tax lawyer, Noek decides to hire a different kind of professional, a hitman. He apparently talked to people who were members of a biker gang that he would like to have the Internal Revenue Service employee, a young woman, deleted. He wanted her murdered. Noak strikes a deal with his hired killer, $20,000 for the agent's death. What Noak doesn't know is that one of the bikers has dropped a dime on him, and the feds are watching when Noak orders the hit. <laughs> Okay. Noak has no idea he's really dealing with an undercover federal agent codenamed the Reaper. And it was the Reaper who was supposed to actually commit the murder to and dispose of the body and the motor vehicle. At their second meeting, the Reaper tells Noak the job is done. The agent is dead. Mr. Nowak paid the second installment of $10,000. And it is after the payment of that second installment that the arrest was effected. Randy Nowak is tried and sentenced to 30 years in prison for attempted murder. He was a calculating psychopath, in my view. He wanted her deleted to ensure that he could uh, avoid his tax obligation. Two years later, another American taxpayer goes after the IRS with a vengeance. The whooshing sound airplanes make, it was whoosh and roar and boom. 53-year-old Andrew Joseph Stack flies his single-engine plane into an IRS building in Austin, Texas, killing himself and an IRS employee. Stack has been in trouble with the IRS several times and left behind a manifesto lashing out at the agency. Extreme attacks on the IRS are thankfully rare. Most people don't resort to violence, but threats against the IRS have increased 37% since 2008. And millions seem to share a deep disdain for the agency. In fact, more than one in 10 Americans polled think it's okay to lie to the IRS. A lot of people cheat on their taxes, um, and we're trying to figure out why. Why do you think that is? People don't feel that they have a moral obligation or a civic obligation to pay. Mm -hmm. There is this notion that sort of everyone else is doing it, and I'm a dupe if I am paying my taxes when my neighbors aren't. From celebrities to professionals, the wealthy and the poor, many seem to think that even though it's illegal, tax evasion really isn't all that bad. 
people think it's like smoking pot. If I choose to smoke marijuana, I'm not hurting anyone. If I choose to not pay taxes, I'm not hurting anyone. Well, sure. I mean, tax evasion is, in a sense, a, a, a victimless crime, or at least the victim is a very remote victim. And we don't really see exactly who's being harmed by it. The current tax system is based largely on voluntary compliance, so it's easy to cheat. Professor Stuart Green says many otherwise honest citizens become tax thieves and justify it any number of ways. Almost everyone thinks the tax code is unfair. No one's really satisfied with what we do with our taxes. So whether you think we're spending money on unjust wars or spending money on supporting welfare, whichever side of the political spectrum you're on, um, you probably don't approve of the tax system. According to a recent survey, 15% of Americans admit they cheat on their taxes. And the most typical American tax cheat? Single men under the age of 45, many of whom admit they push the limits to see what they can get away with. Whatever reason a tax cheater may have for trying to build the system, the odds of succeeding are actually in his favor. Every year, barely 1% of all returns are audited, and only about 0.003% of filers face criminal investigations. Nearly 100,000 IRS employees conduct civil audits nationwide. In most cases, they filter tax returns through a computer program called the Discriminate Function System. The system uses mathematical formulas to identify returns with discrepancies. Attorney Jeff Schnepper, an expert on U.S. tax policy, breaks it down in simple terms. So if you're living in Beverly Hills and you show an income of $20,000, there may be an issue. It's going to click the computer. Uh, if you're living in the ghetto and you're showing a $30,000 charitable contribution, it's going to click the computer. Still, most cheaters are not caught. But before you think scamming the IRS sounds like a good deal, think about this. If people paid what they owed, we'd fund Social Security. We wouldn't have a deficit. Even states like California in the long run would be in the black instead of the red. It's called the tax gap, $300 billion a year in uncollected taxes. The difference between what is actually reported and paid to the IRS and what the agency says should be reported and paid. Nina Olson is the national taxpayer's advocate. Her government office helps taxpayers and proposes IRS reforms to Congress. Essentially, the tax gap um, translates into $2,200 that each taxpayer pays for someone else not paying their own taxes. I and mean, there's all this outrage at the IRS. Why not more outrage at the cheaters? Absolutely. They're not cheating the IRS, but your next door neighbor is going to pay more in taxes if you cheat. And then there's the possibility of becoming one of the 4,700 targets the Criminal Investigation Division goes after each year. If you're suspected of cheating, the CID may soon be on your trail. And these IRS special agents aren't just pencil pushers. Yeah, we're accountants that carry a gun and a badge and we'll, we'll find your money. We have undercover, we do surveillance, we have arrest warrants, we have search warrants. Overall, IRS enforcement results are impressive. For every dollar they spend on investigations, they recover 450. Our cases are criminal in nature. They're not a misunderstanding of the tax code or an adding machine error. The folks we go after are those folks that lie, they cheat. It's not, you know, a real gray area. It's very black and white. What's the lowest level of taxes owed that your office might get involved with? There is no minimum dollar and there's no maximum dollar. We work cases as, as low as $10,000 and as high as $100 million. It doesn't matter what you're worth. If you're a cheater, the IRS wants to find you. Coming up on the American Tax Cheat, country music legend Willie Nelson sells his memories to help pay a $16 million tax bill. But first, small town accountants turn unwitting clients into tax evaders. He said, you know, you could look at prison time for this. High up in Arizona's White Mountains, railroad supervisor Shirley Cornett finds out how far the IRS will go to recoup their losses. For several years, she uses a local firm to name Accurate Consulting to prepare her taxes. They've been around for 25 years up here in our little small community and been preparing taxes for that long. 
Accurate had been getting her about $4,000 a year in tax refunds. Then, in 2008, the firm tells clients about special new tax preparation methods that yield even larger refunds, with the company pocketing 10%. They tell Cornette it is a well-kept secret normally reserved for a privileged few. It was the way senators, congressmen, you know, um, everybody in the government prepared their return. And so that's how they were going to do it for us. The new system yields Cornette a refund 20 times greater than the previous year. Me and my husband make around $200,000 a year. The refund for that year was $83,000. And it was astronomical compared to what we'd ever received before. She questions her preparer about the amount. I was like, are you sure that's right? And she says, believe me, everything we've done is right. And I said, is it legal? And she said, everything we've done is legal. The Cornettes cash their $83,000 IRS check and use it to remodel their home. But soon after, the small town starts buzzing with disturbing rumors. That the IRS had come in, in full task force to accurate consulting, and was going through their files and that sort of thing. The Cornettes know they're caught in a bad situation. My husband said, we need to get an attorney. We need to get one now because I'm afraid we're in a lot of trouble. The principals of the accounting firm are indicted on criminal charges of conspiracy to defraud the government and suspected of filing more than $24 million in fraudulent tax returns since 2001. We'll go after those unscrupulous return preparers and put them in jail, but what's unfortunate is those clients that come in and get sucked into that, they're responsible for all the back taxes and penalties and interest. The Cornettes and the 122 other clients of Accurate Consulting can't escape the long arm of the IRS. Their fate was decided by their own hands. If you sign the return, you're swearing to the accuracy of the return, and if you don't look at it, and if you don't ask questions, you're responsible, you're liable. My attorney told me that. He said, you know, you could look at prison time for this. Your IRS return for that year is fraudulent. First thing we have to do is get your taxes amended. Cornette files an amended return and avoids criminal charges, but she and her husband still owe the IRS $110,000 in taxes, penalties, and fees. Their wages have been garnished, and they struggle to make ends meet. It's scary, it's frustrating. The IRS has put a tax lien on my home. Well, we haven't quit our jobs, um, even when we're not getting a paycheck. We're still going to work every day. You have to keep going. What I want to get out there is taxpayer beware. Um, be careful who you pick to do your taxes. The rich and famous can afford the finest accountants. Yet time and again, we see them in trouble with the IRS as well. In 2011 alone, actor Al Pacino, director Martin Scorsese, and rapper Ja Rule all make news for alleged tax troubles. And then there is arguably the most famous celebrity tax cases of all time. Country and Western music star Willie Nelson is still having his troubles with the tax man. In 1990, the IRS hits Willie Nelson with $16 million in back taxes and penalties. It's over 5,000 a day just in penalties and interest. The agency seizes most of Nelson's assets. They stage auctions of his personal belongings, and fans rally to support him. I think it's a shame, you know, that that has to be happening with him. That's why I'm here. I'm here to support him, help the man out, give him some money. Nelson blames his tax trouble on bad advice. I feel like that I was duped. I was advised to go borrow $12 million over here and get into a tax shelter. To pay off his debt, Nelson releases an album called The IRS Tapes, Fooled by My Memories. They didn't take my ways of making a living, uh, so, uh, and they can't take that. Uh, so, fortunately, I'm still healthy and I can still work. Officially, the IRS says it doesn't hunt for high-profile cases. But exposing A-listers' tax troubles pays off twofold, recouping lost revenue and deterring the masses from cheating. The former chief of the IRS criminal division sheds some light. They are clearly in what we call the general deterrence business. The few cases are brought to deter a much larger number of people. Hence their need to get the best publicity and attention they can to those relatively few cases. 
The IRS does admit to taking a closer look at your return if you happen to be wealthy. The IRS spends much more of its resources auditing um, much higher income uh, individuals because uh, you know, that's where the money is in the system. And to case in U.S. history with telecom entrepreneur Walter Anderson. In the early 90s, Anderson's company, Mid-Atlantic Telecom, merges with Frontier Communications. The deal nets Anderson more than $6 million. He transfers the profits to offshore companies in the British Virgin Islands and Panama and continues to invest in telecom projects, increasing his wealth by more than 60 times in just seven years. In this exclusive phone interview, Walter Anderson acknowledges his success. We were uh, at the right place at the right time. We got very lucky. We, uh, on paper, the value by uh, certainly 1999 was over $400 million. Throughout the late 90s, Anderson travels by private jet, purchases expensive artwork, and donates more than $40 million to fund private space exploration. Walter Anderson played an important role in actually getting the first space tourist, Dennis Tito, up to the International Space Station. Tito wide-eyed, weightless, but feeling right at home. In 1998, Anderson's British Virgin Islands holding company, Golden Appel, earns $126 million. But he reports just $67,000 in income and pays less than 500 bucks in federal income tax. The IRS begins investigating Anderson, but the millionaire says he has no reason to be concerned, claiming that his offshore companies had been created to fund charitable ventures and that he would not personally see any of the profit. I can't do anything that would effectively move money from Golden Appel into my pocket. If I did, uh, I would have a tax liability, obviously, because then it would be my personal money. He says his offshore dealings are transparent and legal. None of this was done uh, out, outside of the light of day and uh, does not have a U.S. tax liability according to the U.S. law, according to my lawyers, my advisors. The IRS does not agree. It charges that Anderson devised a complex network of offshore companies to disguise his true stake in the profits of Golden Appel and that he had one goal in doing so, to avoid paying U.S. taxes on more than $400 million. In February 2005, after a five-year investigation, IRS agents arrest Anderson at Dulles Airport on charges of criminal tax evasion and fraud. Considered a flight risk, Anderson is sent to jail. Two years later, and still behind bars awaiting trial, he pleads guilty to all charges and is sentenced to nine years in federal prison. From his cell, Anderson insists that despite his confession, he is in fact innocent. 
He claims that the terrible conditions of the jail drove him to plead guilty. I pled guilty and it was I was a course. I was treated really, really badly. But I told my lawyer that I didn't do it. I told my friends and family that I was very unhappy with the idea of uh, pleading guilty. Tax expert Jeff Schnepper isn't buying Anderson's claims of innocence. There are gray areas in the code, but when you talk about an Anderson, it's really relatively simple. Did you have income? Are you an American citizen? You have to pay the tax. Walter Anderson may yet owe $100 million in restitution to the IRS and the District of Columbia as his case makes its way through civil tax court. The former space pioneer and telecom mogul is not scheduled to be released until 2014. Because the case is active, the IRS won't comment. There are countless other Americans who have been stashing their money in overseas banking institutions and getting away with it. For more than 70 years, foreign secrecy laws shielded U.S. accounts from the IRS. That is, until late 2006, when Congress strengthened the whistleblowers program and gave the IRS a valuable collection tool, motivated informants. If you've got evidence of tax evasion by someone else, you, you can come in and disclose that information, and the whistleblower can, can earn as much as a third of, of, of the taxes that are recovered. In late 2007, former UBS banker Bradley Birkenfeld registers with the whistleblower's office and provides details of U.S. account holders that UBS has allegedly concealed from the IRS. The U.S. government sues the Swiss banking giant, accusing it of assisting 19,000 U.S. clients and hiding close to $20 billion. In 2009, U.S. courts forced UBS to pay a $780 million fine and release the names of more than 4,000 U.S. clients to the IRS. You think this is a, a real game changer? Because I, I have to admit, I always assumed that people could keep money. If, if they were smart enough and rich enough, they could keep money in a Swiss bank account. Maybe they could keep it in the Cayman Islands and just avoid all of this. And that's what, um, for years, folks thought. We're now working criminal investigations on those folks and civil audits on those folks. I'm just making incredible inroads in getting information from foreign governments um, identifying U.S. taxpayers that think they can hide money, and my agents are out there finding that stuff, and there, there's nowhere where they can hide that money. In May 2009, the IRS offers a five-month voluntary disclosure period. Come forward, and you won't face criminal charges. 15,000 Americans reveal their hidden foreign accounts. The account ranges were anywhere from, from 50,000 to 100 million. The number is staggering. We got that money, we got those taxpayers to come back into the system, pay the tax and interest and penalties that were due on that. In January 2011, WikiLeaks, the organization built on leaks of classified data and other secrets, announces that it intends to release the name of 2,000 U.S. account holders at the Swiss bank Julius Baer. At a press conference, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange accepts the information from former Bear banker Rudolf Elmer. WikiLeaks, in order to have it investigated. I bet it's even worse now that they hear the drumbeat of not knowing if it's going to come out on WikiLeaks that you've been evading your taxes. The WikiLeaks is a good example. Switzerland was just the tip of the iceberg. In my 23 years, I've never had this many banks under investigation. So it's just the, um, the recognition that the, um, the gig is up as far as hiding money internationally. The number of hidden foreign account holders is still unknown, but estimates claim that they may rob the Treasury of 100 billion tax dollars every year. In February 2011, the IRS launches a new period of voluntary disclosure come clean within six months, or risk criminal prosecution. Next on the American Tax Cheat, an IRS crime lab straight out of CSI. This is a class four laser, which is one of the most powerful lasers you can use. And see how tax collectors help take down some of the country's most vicious criminals. We're talking about some of the cruelest people I've ever met in my life, and I've worked gangsters, I've worked everything. 
The Internal Revenue Service has been collecting taxes since 1913, but it's during the Prohibition era that IRS special agents make their mark as CIs, criminal investigators, with their most infamous target. Public enemy number one, they don't come any bigger than Alphonse Capone. At the IRS archives in Washington, CI Deputy Director Rick Raven proudly shows off the original Al Capone case file. You know, of all the years that um, law enforcement tried to get him on the prostitution and the bootlegging and the organized crime, it was this income tax investigation that actually put him in jail. For that time, the amount of unreported income was well over a million dollars. This is amazing. I mean, in some cases, it says that his meat and poultry bills were anywhere from twenty to fifty dollars a day. And that's that's the level of detail that our special agents get down to is exactly how much he's spending a day on food. Yeah, this is pretty thorough stuff. But this is the same way you do things today. This is exactly the same way we investigate today. We we track expenditures of taxpayers to see where that money's going. We follow the money, and we followed it back in 1933, and we follow it today. Only today, in Capone's hometown of Chicago, agents at the National. National IRS Crime Lab have a new arsenal of tools as cutting-edge technology uncovers physical evidence of tax crimes. So it's your job to find the smoking guns? That's exactly what we're looking for. Our crime lab functions just like a crime lab for the FBI or for uh, ATF or any other agency that's out there. Uh, we see hundreds of cases a year that come through the lab. In the latent print lab, diode class 4 laser testing can tie an individual to a suspicious document. So is that enough to positively identify who touched something without an inch of doubt? Absolutely. Luminescent testing uses filters to reveal that first one type of ink, steps of filters, and then another were used on this forged check. OK, so that means it's different ink. This is telling me that that check was originally written out to Mr. Thomas here, and that was a check for $1,000, not right. $21,000. Correct. The dollar amounts can be pretty staggering, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in false returns that have been filed, and we see those tax returns come through here. It's like what we describe as uh, an investigative pie. Another slice of the pie? Computer specialists who work 95% of CID's cases each year, scour suspect hard drives for clues to tax fraud, and even search social networking sites. People brag about the um, money that they've made, they brag about the vacations that they've taken, the assets that they've accumulated, and those items all play into an investigation. Al Capone couldn't brag about his exploits on Facebook. His downfall was his flamboyant lifestyle. Many of today's criminals also think they're untouchable. In Las Vegas, Nevada, pimps running illegal prostitution rings boast about living large and unwittingly place themselves squarely in the crosshairs of the IRS. In February 2011, the Las Vegas Metro Police and SWAT team descend on a home in a quiet...
you'll find a lot of judges and, you know, attorneys, people of influence, that kind of thing. Kramer had two luxury homes and three prostitutes working for him. After he beat one of the women, she turned to the police and led them to Kramer's doorstep. Search warrants uncovered the spoils of a criminal enterprise. There's jewelry sprawled across counters. There's like hidden places with stacks of thousands, you know, 5,000 here, 10,000 in the drawer over there. There's these there's Mercedes Benzes, there's Range Rovers, there's Maseratis. Kramer is arrested, but faces a maximum sentence of just five years. Waiting for his criminal trial, he makes a deal for the asset part of his case, surrendering half of the nearly $400,000 in cash seized by police. The best part is that basically this guy thinks he's going to get away. He's going to get the other 200000 of the cash, along with some jewelry, some very expensive jewelry in his car. So he thinks he's making out. Then the IRS shows up at his jail cell. Uh, they put a lien on everything, and at the same time, that they're handing them the paperwork, the agents are going into the different properties. Ultimately, Kramer surrenders it all and is convicted on two felony counts. He receives a suspended sentence and is now out of the Las Vegas prostitution business, living under strict probation in Texas. It was great because he, he was left with nothing, you know, which is pretty much what, what he left his victims with, with nothing. Ours is the Al Capone legacy, and that is relentlessly following the money. Operating victim. For his part, Snipe says he's actually not a tax protester, but someone who put too much trust in his advisors. People whom I thought had the, uh, the, the knowledge and expertise in the areas of finance and tax law. Uh, that would protect my interest. But for any taxpayer, bad advice is not necessarily an acceptable defense. And for Wesley Snipes, it means that three-year prison sentence. His former attorney believes that Snipes was treated unfairly. There's no doubt that that harsh sentence was imposed in large part, again, to send a message to other Americans that, look, if we can send Wesley Snipe to prison for three years, don't mess with the IRS. 
For hardcore tax protesters, it seems no message is strong enough to convince them to pay, even if it means jail time or worse. In the small New England town of Plainfield, New Hampshire, Edward and Elaine Brown appear to be a model couple. He's a retired exterminator. She's a successful dentist. But they are also self-proclaimed constitutional rangers who believe that no law exists requiring them to pay federal income tax. I wanted to bring this to the attention of the, the general public, so we, the only way we could do that was uh, through civil disobedience and say, hey, OK, let's stop paying taxes for a while and get everyone's attention. For seven years, the couple does not file tax returns. In January 2007, the Browns are convicted of tax evasion and fraud and ordered to pay the IRS $625,000 in back taxes. Again, they refuse to pay and barricade themselves in their home. Seeking a peaceful resolution, law enforcement keeps a loose perimeter, allowing supporters and the media to come and go. We have no wish to have a violent encounter with them or in any way, shape, or form have to hurt either one of them. Believing they are under siege, the Browns attempt to rally their fellow tax protesters. If they come in, it's, we're dead. That's it, we will not, we will not, we will not be arrested. We will not volunteer to go into their prison for a non-crime. We have committed no crimes. So we don't submit. We, to we told them we, we either walk out of here free or we die. In October 2007, six months into the standoff, U.S. Marshals pose as supporters and enter the Brown House. By the time Ed and Elaine Brown realized this, they were in custody. In 2009, they are convicted of multiple obstruction of justice and weapons-related charges. Each is sentenced to more than 30 years in federal prison. Next on the American Tax Sheet, what do you really know about the qualifications of your tax preparer? We found one place that was a dog groomer's um, salon, but they also prepared taxes. According to the IRS, the law is clear. You must pay your fair share in taxes. But even for the honest taxpayer, figuring out what is owed is no simple task. We've got a tax system that people don't understand. It's complicated, it's convoluted, it changes every year. And every year, Americans spend more than six billion hours complying with tax laws. It's a mountain of paperwork and a mountain of money in aggravation. It spells huge profits for the tax preparation industry. 60% of Americans pay for help to file their returns, spending an average of $258 every tax season to navigate the more than 3 million words in the U.S. tax code. We spend about $20 billion a year, roughly, just filing our tax returns. It's big business, and with the complexity of the law, we need them to help us file our tax returns. As we've seen, paying for tax advice does not guarantee a perfect filing. There is no licensing system for the estimated 900,000 preparers in the United States. Anybody could just open a shop, you know, hang up a shingle and prepare taxes. We found one place that was a dog groomer's um, salon, but they also prepared taxes. In 2011, the IRS announces a plan to curb the tide of bad advice, beginning with those calling themselves tax preparers. They will be registered with the Internal Revenue Service, and going forward, tax preparers will have to take an exam to demonstrate their competency for preparing taxes. Steps have also been taken to simplify the process of filing. California offers a ready return program for state tax returns. Taxpayers start with a return that is partially completed with their reported income. To file, they simply need to verify the state's numbers and sign. Almost everything the government asks you to supply in your tax return, it already knows. FISA doesn't send you a blank piece of paper each month and ask you to put down all your purchases and add it up and then fine you if you're wrong. They start the ball rolling by sending you a bill. So that's the ready return approach. Proponents say that providing taxpayers with what the government already knows cuts down on mistakes and saves time and money. We found the average taxpayer saved about $30 and a half an hour. And this is just for having a simple state tax return 
prepared in advance. So that gives you a sense with 140 million federal returns, how many billions of dollars in time and money we could be looking at. But not everyone is a fan. The tax preparation industry, not surprisingly, doesn't like it. Some companies see this as a threat to the business. The tax preparers do have an interest in the tax code staying complicated. Absolutely. If it's too easy, I don't need you anymore. There's no question that tax preparers have as strong an interest uh, as anyone in having a complex tax code. Back in 1986, Congress tried to simplify the federal tax code. We went down to three rates. We, dis we disallowed a whole bunch of deductions. We, we said, you know, let's, let's keep it nice and simple and clean. It sounded like a good idea, but little by little, Congress bowed to lobbying from nearly every segment of society. New deductions and complex rules were added, leaving us with an even more complicated code today. Wherever you are, you probably are lobbying indirectly for Congress. So if you're a school teacher, there's a school teacher's lobby. If you're an environmentalist, there's an environmental lobby. And of course, if you're a business person, there's lots of business lobbying. With so many deductions ripe for the picking, many taxpayers are tempted to claim things they don't necessarily qualify for. They view it as so complex, and they view that others take advantage of loopholes, and they're going to get themselves a loophole. And there's still the problem of the 15% of Americans who say they think it's OK to cheat the IRS. Is it enforcement that would stop people from doing this? Is it a simpler tax code? Is it fear itself? Right. Well, it's probably a, a, all three of those things. To change the way we talk about taxes in our political process would help. I think uh, that. Um, having a tax code that was more understandable and less complex would make people more uh, inclined to pay their taxes and, and cooperate with the government. The moral of the whole concept here is relatively simple. Pay your taxes. Obey the law. Or they're going to get you. They might not get you this year. They might not get you next year. But eventually, they're going to get you. Like it or not, taxes are here to stay. And for many, so is the temptation to lie about what they owe. As we've seen, playing a game of chance with the IRS can lead to financial ruin, even prison. And those who aren't caught cheat us all, forcing honest citizens to bear the burden of the revenue shortfall. So to cheat or not to cheat, that is the question. The final decision is yours. I'm Becky Quick. Thanks for watching.